So, deep sea in the 80s. So, I was born in 1960. So, I was there when during the 68 riots. I remember when Doc, as I was eight years old, I remember Dr. King being assassinated. I remember Kennedy being assassinated. I yeah. remember the riots, all that. And, and then I remember DC getting home rule. You know, DC couldn't elect its own government until 1974. And I was 14. And that's when I met Barry. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and so, uh, you know, and, and if it weren't for Barry, I wouldn't be where I am today. And, uh, I mean, now, you know, um, uh, you know, his shortcomings are well documented. I don't have any interest in relitigating those, right? Uh, but, yeah. he, but he did an awful lot of good for a lot of folks in that city. So welcome, guys, to Heart of the City. This is a really, really special episode. Um, all of our guests are excellent. Our guest today, though, is uh, really does reside in rare air. Uh, this is Don Peebles, head of the Peoples Corporation. Uh, by all accounts, in every publication that I can find, uh, the largest, most successful black developer in the country. Um, and so for that, number one, we salute him. Um, and so today, though, we're, we're bringing him to you. And we're going to talk about uh, you know real estate development. We're going to talk about the advice that he has for aspiring developers and entrepreneurs. Uh, we're going to talk about the role of entrepreneurs uh, socially, you know, in this moment that we all find ourselves in. It's going to be pretty casual. I hope you guys enjoy it. Uh, think of it as a fireside chat. Uh, and so we're just going to kick off a, a pretty casual conversation uh, here in a moment. So welcome to the show. Um, and thank you, Don. Thank you again. Good to be here. Absolutely. So we're going to have a, a casual chat. Um, Don's going to give us a little bit of his background, having been born in D.C., grown up in D.C., but also in Detroit a little bit. Don, can you just take us through that chronology real quick? Yeah, absolutely. So I, um, my history is like so many of us. Um, my uh, grandparents, uh, my maternal grandparents came to D.C. Um, and actually uh, with their parents and they met in D.C. Uh, and they uh, you know, were married and my grandparents had five girls uh, and uh, my mother was the middle of five girls and they all went to D.C. public schools, including Spingarn High School. And uh, my father grew up in uh, rural Virginia, got drafted by the Korean War. Uh, but his mother had moved to D.C. because uh, his parents got divorced. And, uh, and so he came when he was discharged. He came to Washington, D.C. Um, and then worked as an auto mechanic, got trained as an auto mechanic through the kind of GI Bill. And then uh, um, ended up being an auto mechanic, met my mother. They got married. And, uh, and I was born, uh, my mother was 19 when I was born, and I was born in 1960. So the time period of, you know, the country was moving forward, civil rights movement was in the, uh, you know, in full swing, John Kennedy got elected president. Um, and so, you know, I grew up in Washington, D.C., and I can remember um, in uh, 1968, uh, that was the year that Dr. King was killed, uh, uh, Robert Kennedy, and I remember the uh, the riots of 68 and, uh, and, and what happened in D.C. And my mother and I um, left. Uh, my parents were divorced when I was five. My mother and I moved to Detroit, um, where her um, older sister lived with her husband who was doing his residency. And, uh, and she had decided for a change of location and a change of career. So she had uh, bought a house in Prince George's County um, and saw the uh, closing statement and how much money the agent made for doing so little work. And she right. said, oh, I can do that too. And uh, so she got her license in uh, Detroit. And then um, a couple of years later, started her own brokerage business. And my uncle, who was a, uh, a physician, he invested in her business. And so she had a real estate brokerage business. And so we lived in Detroit from 68 to 1973. And what was great about Detroit was African-American entrepreneurship. First of all, you had the automobile industry. So African-Americans, we're getting a lot of jobs within the automobile industry, but also my best friend's father happened to be Barry Gordy. And Barry <laughs> Gordy made uh, Detroit the epicenter of the music industry. And so I grew up, my cousins lived in an area called Palmer Woods in Detroit, and down the street was Eddie Kendricks. Come on. Um, and then Norman Whitfield. And Norman Whitfield Jr. Um, was one of my good friends. And so 
Um, and we went to school together. Wow. And so and then there were black doctors and lawyers and so forth. So I never I mean, I saw black entrepreneurs doing things. And uh, and then, you know, it also gave me a lifelong love of music. Yeah. And uh, and so my, and where I live, where my mother and I lived uh, in downtown Detroit, the um, residents there were Melvin Franklin of the Temptations. <laughs> I used to ride up the elevator when um, when Eddie Kendricks left the Temptations. Um, you know, uh, Damon Will, Damon Harris yeah. um, was uh, came in replacement. He lived in my building, as did Dennis Edwards. Wow! And so, very cool. And, uh, you know, a couple of the Supremes lived in the building as well. So, I mean, it was a very interesting time in Detroit. And, um, and so my mother and I left Detroit in 1973 during the recession. And she went homesick, went back to D.C. And that's where I finished, um, you know, uh, my childhood. And I um, went to public schools in D.C. And in my last two years of high school, my mother thought, I, was, I mean, I was an athlete, but I was also out there, you know, you know, hanging out. And so she thought I needed more structure. And she arranged for me to get um, a position as a page on Capitol Hill. And so it's like a messenger for high school students. But you went to school on the top floor of the Library of Congress and then worked in the floor of the House of Representatives in the U.S. Capitol. And so I went to school from uh, six in the morning until 1030 and walked across the street from 11 o'clock until seven o'clock or so. Hmm. Um, I, uh, you know, went to work on Capitol Hill and then I played sports and was on a chess team and, you know, met a lot of interesting people. Um, that was from 1976 to 1978. Okay. So, I mean, there were the Black Caucus was just recently formed and there were 13 black members of Congress yeah. and, uh, and they were all bigger than life. Yeah. And so I got a chance to see that too. I mean, this, this era that you're talking about, you know, the, um, Traditionally, D.C. used to be called anyway, Chocolate City. Um, I, I don't think it really has that moniker anymore. <laughs> um, in fact, I think officially we, it went sub 50 percent a few years ago. But this era that you're talking about, um, it was kind of a golden age. You know what I mean? It was an amazing time in D.C. D.C. was 70 plus percent. Right. Black. Um, in 1974, when I was 14, it got the right to the city got the right to elect its own government, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and and um, two years later, it elected. I mean, four years later, it elected Marion Barry, but its first government in 74, yeah. black mayor, black chairman of the city council, and vastly majority uh, black city council. I think out of 13 council members, two were white and 11 were black. Yeah. And uh, and then four years later, somebody who mentored me became mayor. Um, and, uh, that was, uh, in 1970, 1978, yeah. uh, Mary Barry got elected mayor of DC and that changed DC forever in That's so right. many positive ways. That's uh, right. Yeah. So this actually brings me to something that I wanted to talk, um, a fair amount about is that I, I read or maybe I saw an interview, but there was a quote that you had that really struck me. You said, uh, something to the effect of. Um, success, talking about the path that is success. You said um, it's not a sprint. It's not a marathon. It's actually a relay race. Yeah. And I just thought that that was such a great image and really powerful. And it just reminded me of, um, you know, knowing your story a bit and how Barry was influential and sort of helped to seed the ground for you and, and the folks in your cohort to be able to do the things that uh, we saw happen in D.C. in the 80s. I'd love to just talk to you about that today, right? Um, several things, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on what other things made that era so special. How can we recreate that? You know, and why is that sort of the notion of legacy and passing it on, right? It's being a relay race. Why is that so important? I mean, I, th I mean, look, if you look at um, how we, at, you know, how our country got to where we are today and how black people got to where we are today. It was, I mean, we have the right to do everything that anyone else does, but that right is now kind of taken for granted. But back in the 1940s, 50s, 30s, and even 1960s, yeah. that right wasn't there. And so it was the John Lewis's, the Martin Luther King's, the Medgar Evers, the Rosa Parks. And by the way, I met Rosa Parks because she worked in John Conger's office. Get out. And I was John, my last year of high school, 
I was an intern in John Conyers' Washington office, and Rosa Parks um, worked in his district office in Detroit. I'll never forget the first time she called. And I said, who? She said, no, it's Rosa Parks. I said, Rosa Parks? Right. And that was my job was answering the phone. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, so, I mean, it was a ton. So all these people fought so that my generation and future generations would have a better shot right. at life to basically have the basic American fundamental rights of the pursuit of liberty, life, liberty, and happiness. And um, on an equal basis. Mm -hmm. And so my view in that is that I owe a debt that can't be repaid because so many people not only gave their time, their careers and risked their lives, yeah. but they actually gave their lives. And so many untold people gave their lives. And so it wasn't for me to then take that and say, thank you, mm -hmm. and then have great prosperity singularly. Right. So so we got a long way to go. And so Barry was an outgrowth of that, as was Mayor Jackson, as mm -hmm. was Harold Washington and other black mayors. And so they took that responsibility very seriously. I mean, I say what people want to say about Mary and Barry. I mean, the day he took office, his, his inaugural speech was now the people who've been locked out of opportunity, these doors are opening now and what he represented and what he was committed to. And that was advancing black people economically, educationally, right. health, reforming the criminal justice system, appointed a black police chief. I mean, you look at what he did. And so black people in D.C., we had a different swagger to ourselves, too. Yeah, yeah. We knew that there was a government that was led by somebody who wanted to empower us. We weren't afraid of the police because the yeah. police chief was black. Right, right. I mean, so, um, and, you know, and, and I can think about my experiences growing up there. So it was so my job. And so so. So, the, so Martin Luther King and that others took us to a place, and then it was Barry Washington and others that Andrew Young, and yeah, others, that's they right. took us to the next place, and then it was that created the environment for a Barack Obama, right? And that also created the environment for people like me, Bob Johnson, yeah. Robert Smith, and some of the others. And so, our obligation is to now pass that um, baton to the next generation of people who can take us even further. Yeah. And so, so, I mean, so I see this as, you know, a relay because not one of us is going to get there by ourselves. And during our time period where we're the most effective, we're not going to, we're not going to get us there by our, one person's not going to. So it takes all of us to yeah. get us there. And we got to recognize that That's right. and, 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 and accept the responsibility that we have because of what so many other people gave to get us here. Absolutely. I, I think, too, that um, not only was was that cohort that you're talking about, you know, Barry and, uh, you know, uh, Maynard Jackson and uh, Andy, Young, all, all those were really exceptional folks. Um, Barry's story is particularly interesting, too, because, um, you know, D.C., he, he was a particularly powerful mayor. Like you don't right. Like you don't see that now. It, you, why was that? What what was going on that he was able to you know have so much say? Because Barry, if I if I recall, he literally came in and said, uh, starting today, thirty five percent or something like that of vendors are going to be black. Just flat out, just said it. Yep, all thirty five percent of all contracts will be by black. It would be awarded to black business. That's right. And that's what he said in nineteen seventy nine when he came into office. And um, but so Barry. Um, came in as mayor. So when the city had this, um, it was the city was run by Congress, mm. all the authority vested in the president. And the president would designate the authority. So, so the president appointed the mayor of the District of Columbia and appointed the chairperson, appointed the city council members. So the pre most power vested in the president. So when it came to the mayor's office, all the power of the mayor's office was vested with the president. Mm. So part of it what happened is when Congress changed the charter, they took a shortcut and they empowered the mayor with most of the presidential powers, except for the appointments of mm. these the city council and others. So the mayor was a sole contracting officer. Got it. The mayor was signed contract for 20 years, um, no dollar limit and so on. So Barry was extremely powerful that way. And also Barry was a person of the people. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so he had the freedom 
to no matter how much money somebody else raised to run against him, the the people knew he was fighting for them. Right. And so they stood with him. And so and he was also willing to use his power yeah. Um, yeah. because he wasn't apologizing. He did. He, he felt his role was to rebalance the scales, yeah. to be a good yeah. mayor, run the city well. But his job was to take affirmative steps to empower black people. That's right. Today, I don't think you could get a mayor in the United States of any major city to actually say just that. Right. Right. Wow. Um, well, I, I, I'm a beneficiary of it. As I shared with you before we went on, um, you know, I got my first job as, as a result of his uh, youth employment program, which not only employed people, but kept folks from doing you know bad things that they might have if they were in the street and didn't have a job. So um, a lot of benefits were down from what he did. Uh, let's talk a little bit about how that relationship with Barry is really kind of the uh, kind of the the instigating thing that started your career into real estate. I know you met him very very young, I think as a teenager, but then uh, by your early twenties, you were active in his campaign and even got an appointment. Can you talk about that kind of pivot? Yeah, DC was a very uh, political city, obviously. Right. Um, and my last two years of high school made me even more political. And before then, my mother believed in, you know, politics, mainly because of the civil rights movement about getting access to opportunity and fairness. And so the big thing back then was, I mean, the right to vote was so hard fought right. that it was, you know, people took it very seriously as an obligation to vote and be engaged. And so my mother um, grew up that way. And so she was very politically involved. And so as a result, I got politically involved. And so I volunteered for Barry's campaign one summer um, in you know, 74. And then um, when he, um, then he ran for mayor um, and then I went off to college. And then after my first year of college, I, just, I was going to be a doctor. And after my first year of college, I decided that I wanted to do something else. And I thought about real estate. So I came back to D.C. It was 1979. And I was going to be a sales agent, mm. but interest rate was 22 percent, and um, and so no one could qualify. I could sell, but people would say, "Yeah, if you can get us a mortgage, right, yeah. great, we'll buy." It. But no one could because the interest rates were too high. So I learned appraising, which my mother um, had a, a small appraisal business, and so I learned appraising from her. Worked for her for a while, then went and worked for another company, uh, and then ultimately started my own appraisal business when I was 23 in 1983. But when I came back to D.C. Um, in, in 1979, I kind of began to be more aware of what was going on locally. And so in 82, Barry was running for reelection. I was 21, 22 at the time. So I got more involved in his campaign. And I understood how politics worked because I spent my time on Capitol Hill. So I got engaged and did a couple of events for him, meet the candidate. And then I did. He was running against Patricia Roberts Harris, who was the former secretary of HUD. Hmm. HEW under Jimmy Carter and was a very accomplished person and people thought she would win. Sure. I knew DC and so I said Barry's gonna win this. And uh and one, you know, he would be very helpful to people like me. So I um got an idea that a couple of days after the primary, I went to I scheduled a fundraiser for a couple of days after the primary. So he hadn't won the primary yet, but I said, let's do a fundraiser, you know, two days after. Right. And when all and then I invited all the people who gave to Pat Harris. I went through their <laughs> finances, but I didn't know many people had any money. So I had to have a gimmick. Yeah. So I did the scene where I'm at the, at the Capitol Hilton in D.C. And we just went through the um, list of contributors for Pat Harris and sent them all, um, you know, an invitation. And that for breakfast with, with Mary Bear. And at that point, so it was standing room only. I mean, they were bringing in more chairs. I mean, you know, um, and uh, and that was the first and Tom Barry kind of saw me as an adult. OK. And, and uh, you know, and then that began what would be, you know, a, a very close relationship, yeah. and friendship um, for the rest of his life. That's a very savvy move for a 22 year old. Don. I mean, and because and I, I hope that people caught that because <clears throat> you were so confident in him winning that you booked it. For after the primary, he had not won yet, but it also gave those people who were supporting the opponent the ability to save face and get on board with the winning horse after the fact. Right. And, and, and the campaign 
would, Barron's campaign wouldn't pay for the invitations at all because they were focusing on winning the primary. So I had to pay for it with my little bit of money I had. Yep. And I mean, it just turned out to be, you know, I felt that worst case scenario, he loses. And yeah. you know, so, OK, there'll be some people that show up, but it won't matter. I mean, but if he wins, I mean, it gives me some leverage. Right. And, you know, um, and, and we did. I got a chance and I introduced him at the breakfast. Oh, wow. Um, and uh, so young 22 year old person introducing him um, and, uh, you know, and then, you know, that was the beginning. And then from there on. Um, I became one of the key political fundraisers in D.C. for local politics gotcha. from that point on. But a year, a few months later after he got, you know, re- inaugurated for a second term or as they were building the administration for a second term, one of the people I met in the campaign called me and asked me if I would uh, be interested in being the president or the chairperson of the uh, real estate um, commission. Okay. And I said, absolutely. Yeah. It turns out that you had to be a licensed broker and I was a sales agent. So there was a woman, um, white woman, actually, who was a chair, was a special assistant to the mayor for boards and commissions. Hmm. She was an old, longtime community activist. And so she called me up and said that the uh, mayor's team had sent my name there for the real estate commission, but I wasn't qualified to do it because I wasn't a broker. Hmm. And the better place for me was a property tax appeal board. And I was familiar with that because my mother had served on that board from 1974 to 78 nice. um, or 79, I think it was. And so she had just gotten off that board. And so I knew it. Right. And, uh, and I said, yeah, that would be great. She said, well, we just sent um, uh, we just had two vacancies and we sent the names up to the mayor's office and he's going to sign them at any any moment. Now the appointments will be made. And um, and then, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, We'll let you know when the next vacancy is, which will be about two years or so from now. I'm thinking, I don't have two years. I'm in a rush. So the campaign manager for Marion um, was now deputy mayor for economic development, um, Ivan O'Donnell. So I called him and I said, look, and I knew him. He knew me since I was about 14 as well. He was with Barry during um, the SNCC days. And uh, and so I told him that I wanted to get appointed to the um, you know, uh, property tax appeal board. And that, you know, I was an appraiser. I knew, you know, the appraisal business. I also knew the board a bit because my mother was on it and talked to me about it all the time. And I really would appreciate this favor. Um, and I'll serve the mayor well. Wow. And uh, but then you got to do it right away because right. the mayor's already appointed vacancy. So a day or two later, he said, "I'll look into it." And then a day or two later, um, I got a call from that same woman and said. I mentioned to them, I just came back from the mayor's office. I mentioned to him that you were interested in this board and I told him he should appoint you. Wow. Um, and uh, he appointed you. And I knew that was BS because Ivanhoe basically <laughs> pulled, my, pulled somebody's name right. and put mine up there. And, uh, and then so I, I you know, I, so she said, you'll have to go before the city council and uh, get confirmation. Yeah. And um, we'll prepare you for that. And so and they did. And then I went and testified. And the chairman of the Committee on Finance and Revenue um, at that time was John Wilson. Okay. John Wilson, um, it was, you know, someone I knew from my teenage days as well, because he worked in SNCC, Student Nonviolent yeah. Coordinating Committee. And uh, so, you know, and he and I became long term friends as well. And uh, um, and the mayor appointed me as chairperson of that board. And I was just turned 24. And, uh, and that was considered one of the most powerful boards, real estate boards in, in the city. I was a member of the mayor's uh, cabinet and, uh, you know, um, on my way. Now, it, it, it blows my mind that you were doing this at 24. I don't, I don't want to tell you what I was doing when I was 24, Don, but it wasn't this. So um, it's just really impressive that you were putting these pieces together so early. Did you already have designs on um, becoming a builder or were you just looking to build relationships and figure out how to leverage the access and the power that you were gaining for some time later? No, I wanted to be a developer and I made a really, I mean, a difficult decision um, and uh, for me personally, yeah. and it probably heartbreaking for my parents when I quit college. And so I went in their eyes from being, you know, a future doctor yeah, to yeah. a college dropout. And so I had to make my, I'm, part of it was I wanted to make my point 
that, and I told my mother that I would be a multimillionaire before I would have graduated from medical school. And you watch that happen. Wow. And, uh, and so I was in a, a, a rush, in a, you know, to make my point. And I was ready, I mean, to, to get to a different space. And I wanted to be a developer when I learned about in high school, my mother, you know, explained, I learned the real estate business and so forth. And I, I met a couple of developers at some political things. Mm-hmm. And that's what did they do? And she explained that they build the buildings and so forth. I said, okay, that's what I'm going to do. Mm-hmm. And so even in my high school yearbook, I said, and graphic for my senior year, I said, I was going to go to medical school, be an orthopedic surgeon, mm-hmm. invest in real estate and become wealthy through real estate and then go into politics. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I skipped one. Yeah. And so, yeah. um, you know, but I mean, I, I was focused on being a developer, but I understood I had to pay some dues to get there. And so I was just trying to accelerate yeah. the dues and also learning the business. I knew what I was doing. Sure. And then you know, within, a, within about 26, I was a multimillionaire. Well, listen, it, it's uh, probably the best first line to a business book that I have seen. The first line of the people's principles is my first deal made me a multimillionaire. Line one, I was like, okay, we're off to the races. Um, can you break down that first deal for folks? Yeah, I mean, so so I, so I as I was doing, taking these steps, like on the property tax billboard, I, as I worked, as I said, as an appraiser for my mother, and then I was an appraiser for a private company. And then I, my mother got business from, the, as an appraiser in her business, had Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, okay. as a client. And the Veterans Administration is a client and then some banks. So I said, OK, I can duplicate that. So I, I knew the people in HUD because I was taking her work down there and I'm an affable person. So I tried. So I tried to get on the approved list um, for HUD, which would guarantee me a certain you know level of, of appraisal. Work. Sure. So I couldn't get break the door down there. So one of my high school classmates was now uh, on staff of Congressman Dellums, who was where I did an internship when I was in high school, and I continued to maintain the relationship. So he he graduated college and gone back to work on Capitol Hill. So I said, look, I need you to write a letter mm. and make some phone calls for me um, and tell them to consider me. So he called the area office director for HUD for D.C. and said the congressman had you know, known me in a long time, and they you know, recommended that they take a look at me. And really, you know, give a young black man a chance. And so ultimately it took maybe a couple calls and a, and a couple meetings with me, meeting with the area director. And then the good news was is that the person who ran real estate was a Latino gentleman who I had been pretty friendly with when I took my mother's stuff down there and I met him over the years. And so he was not resistant. And so I got appointed, I got a, I got approved by HUD and then a a year or so later, the Veterans Administration. So I had a good source of work coming in right. and I started my own appraisal business. So by 23 or so, I was I started my own appraisal business and I was able to tell the person at HUD that if I'm qualified to assess all 165,000 properties in the District of Columbia for tax purposes as chairman, as, as a member of the property tax board, board which is before I became chairperson, yeah. I certainly can appraise a few houses. Right. And so ultimately, that got me started. So I, once I got my, and I started that business out of the living room of my apartment. And then as I started growing, I said, I want people to take me seriously. I got to have an office and I got to have some staff. So I got an office in Georgetown on a sublet. It was a great deal, but it was more space than I needed. So I sublet the space to two real estate brokers. Okay. So one day I was working in my office and one of the real estate brokers who also happened to be a member of the property tax appeal board came into my office and he says, look, I got this deal you should look at. And he shows me this piece of property in Southeast DC at Anacostia. Mm. And I said, what do I want a piece of property in Anacostia? I told you, I want to build a building downtown. Right. And he then handed me a letter and it was on the letterhead of the mayor of the District of Columbia. And it was a letter from the mayor to this major white developer committing to lease office space on a building that this developer was proposing to build in Anacostia um, on this guy's, uh, this guy's client's site. And I said, so what's the problem? He said, well, my client wants $900,000. And 
um, this, the buyer only want, this developer only wants to pay seven fifty, mm. and my client's very stubborn. I said, really? <laughs> They're haggling over one hundred fifty thousand dollars. Right. Yeah. I said, okay, let me get. Uh, and, and I said, set up a meeting. And I've been pursuing a deal in downtown that we didn't get, but I'd assembled three investors. Mm -hmm. So I called them up and said, how would you like to own half of an office building pre-leased that we can develop and pre-leased to the D.C. government? And they said, great. So we cut a deal 50-50. They put up the money and I got half the deal. They didn't have the deal. And I, put, and I did all the political yeah. and, other, and other work. So, um, and I figured that Reading that letter, the mayor were willing to lease from them. Right, he's going to be willing to lease from me. Absolutely, and uh, and so ultimately we did a deal with the city um, and uh, moved forward. But one thing that happened that would be indicative of what I would face for throughout my career and what Black people face every day is I got a phone call while I was negotiating that deal. I got a phone call from the Washington Post that reported the Washington Post. Yeah. So my my secretary gave me, you know, uh, a message um, from, uh, you know, uh, this reporter. And I'm like, wow, this must, I mean, good news. Yeah. Travel for this. Right. Why, a, a black man born and raised in D.C. Right. But to help rebuild and revitalize a black community. Sure. Damaged by the 68 riots. What a good news story. What could be better? Well, right. So the guy, get, I call the guy back and he says, I'm an investigative reporter of the, from the Washington Post. And I want to talk to you about the deal that you're working on in Anacostia. People are saying that it's an insider deal and that the mayor's doing this because you are mm -hmm. a political supporter of his. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget, you know, my surprise. And it changed my whole perspective of how I saw the media and what I saw happening. And so this guy did a story an in-depth story. I mean, he called the people I was doing, the government employees who were scared to hear from the media about, you know, who were negotiating the lease from us, called the mayor's office, called the city council office, followed people around to interview them, which will really disrupt my business. And yeah. what happened, of course, is the developer who lost the deal, he sent the media after me. And so I remember the big saving grace was that the letter I described that the mayor wrote to the white developer, right. the right. rent was $22.50 per square foot. Okay. On my deal, it was $18.75 a foot. And I'll never forget my white partner saying, what are we doing? We should be charging more, not less, because this is a minority deal. You're a minority. Yeah, They're yeah. supposed to want to help you. Right. And I said, no, you got to understand, this is the black tax. That's right. I mean, that's right. there is no. So so that saved us. Yeah. Um, but it showed one. Not only did I have to be as good, I had to be better. Yeah. Yeah. Two, this was not government land. They were pre-leasing an office building from me. If we didn't deliver, the government lost nothing. Right. And the Washington Post was used to try to slow me down. Yeah. And if they didn't stop me this time, they were going to scare people yeah. from doing business with me in the future. So, and that was the beginning of what happened. And every deal I did in D.C., they would focus on. Right, right. So what, what's interesting here, and I want folks to definitely take away, I, I think I shared early on that um, <clears throat> a lot of our audience are uh, aspiring developers. Some of them are house flippers. A lot of them are house flippers looking to level up you know, and, and get to doing the kinds of things that, uh, that you are, this is a property, this is a deal where you had found the opportunity. I imagine that, or, or maybe you were liquid enough, uh, but, but did the people that you brought on board to partner with, did they provide the liquidity? Yeah. All the money. Yeah. Okay. And, and I asked the question because the thing that I hear consistently, um, is that the reason you don't see more black developers is just because the liquidity requirements are so stringent, you know, just yeah, to get in the game. Access, and access to capital. Yeah. I mean, development business is a very leverage-oriented business. Real estate is leverage-oriented. I mean, the key is you're going to borrow at low interest rates, mm -hmm. and the property is going to produce a return at a higher interest rate, yeah. and you're going to make that spread, that arbitrage. And so the name of the game is always kind of levering up. And so... What's interesting is if you think about a $100 million development project, um, the senior debt um, is going to be about 
75%. And then there's going to be another 25 that's required for equity. The developer is going to go to the private equity markets, the Goldman Sachs, the mm-hmm. Blackstones, the Black Rocks, et cetera. And they're going to go to them or some private equity fund. And that private equity fund is going to put up 90% of that $25 million. Mm-hmm. And the developer is going to put up two and a half, two and 25, it's going to put in 10%, which is two and a half million dollars. Right. So a developer can control uh, and develop a hundred million dollar project with $2.5 million of their own money. Right. The fees, the development fees on a hundred million dollar project are four and a half million dollars. Mm. So before the building's finished, they're going to get their money back mm. plus $2 million. So, so that, so it's the access to that LP That's right. partner capital investment capital from the private equity markets. The challenge is that the allocators of that capital are rarely black yeah. and that they are going to do business with people who they're comfortable with. Yeah. And yeah. that is, and so out of the $69 trillion in private equity and venture capital dollars, less than 1.3% of it goes to people of color or women. Together. And people of color together. and women. Wow. And, right. and so of the venture of the private equity money that goes into real estate, less than three tenths of one percent go to black people. So, so while we're thirteen percent of the population, we get three tenths of one percent of the capital mm-hmm. for real estate development. Which uh, the uh, irony of this all is that the vast major, the biggest investors in private equity are public employee uh, pension right. funds, government employees save their pension and retirement and and and, to, and private sector workers yeah so calpers but, calters yeah. Yeah. exactly and virginia mm-hmm. uh, you know and and new york state common all these pension systems they are disproportionately diverse yeah so because black people rarely get fair treatment looking for jobs in the private sector the government has been the place where they can we can get a fair right. chance and right. employment so the a significant amount. So, for example, in New York City, it would be over 30 percent of the people paying into the pension system are black. Mm-hmm. Because and, these are the public service workers. These are uh, janitors and uh, you name it. Uh, public service. School teachers. School teachers. You know, yeah. Clerks at the government. So so the irony is that we can't even get fair access to our own money. That's right. And that more often than not, the developers that come into communities to gentrify them yeah. are getting private equity money so that the workers' own money is being used to gentrify and run them out of their own communities. Wow. And so people don't understand that. Yeah. yeah. They don't understand how real estate is financed. Mm-hmm. And that's how this injustice is allowed to continue. Yeah. I mean, every I mean, if if you there was a survey done. Black businesses, 2,600 black businesses, mm-hmm. over 80% said they spent the biggest amount of their time finding money for their business. Yeah. And that 80% of them started their business with their own money. So no access to investment capital. You can yeah. look at a company like WeWork that got six or seven billion dollars of investment money is now going to go bankrupt. These many these tech companies that get capital yeah. that end up, you know, um, you know, not working out or yeah. that does work out. But yet when it comes to our businesses, we don't get free access to capital. And that's why you don't see any diversity in real estate. So this is really interesting. I, I want to at least tackle one more of your deals, um, but I want to stay here for a second uh, because it pertains to this current moment that we're in. And I'm curious, you know, um, you started seeing so so Calpers for folks who don't know is a California uh, pension retirement system. I believe that's what the acronym is. And there's another one for California teachers. Uh, literally the biggest pension in the country, and sort of um, you know, they, I don't think they can make an investment that's less than a hundred million bucks or something like that. And what Don is saying is that the people who work in those agencies are mostly black and brown, but then the folks who actually go and get that money to make it to invest it. Uh, tend not to be us. And so my question for you, though, Don, in this moment that we're in, you know, you started seeing these emerging managers programs come out, you know, a while ago. That was around securities. Have you seen the CalPERS of the world and those big institutions? Have they weighed in 
on this current moment on BLM? Have they said we're going to allocate more, you know, to black developers and let them have access to this capital? I haven't. I'm not saying it hasn't happened, but I haven't heard that. No, I mean, look. So, so the the it used to be minority investment advisors, and it got changed to emerging to make it race neutral. Right. So emerging today means first, second, third time fund okay. um, manager or white woman or African American or assets under management of less than a billion dollars. Gotcha. That's kind of the definition of emerging. So again, passing us by in terms of create leveling the playing field and trying to make up, which no one could ever do, right. for 246 years of slavery and 150 years of oppression. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so what happens is that there's no, I mean, we're out right now trying to um, raise a fund for emerging developers. We're okay. building a business platform now to provide access to capital for minority developers, mainly African-American developers and women. Hmm. And um, and so we're out, you know, talking to institutional investors about participating in this kind of fund. Mm -hmm. And we got no one said it's a bad idea. We got a lot of good traction. I mean, I've been in, we've been in the business. We've been in business for over 35 years. We got four plus billion dollars of projects. Right. I mean, our, the size of the fund is one of our buildings, um, you know, and so. Um, so we, you know, made our rounds, and you know, we were getting some interest. Okay. I will say that after um, George Floyd's death mm -hmm. and the protesting that followed it, there's been a much greater level of interest. Mm, okay. And uh, and so, in fact, I was on a call with a um, a municipal uh, pension system, uh, um, you know, uh, um, official, mm -hmm. and who has a very senior position and who's a white woman and said, look, we're more interested in helping African-American mm -hmm. um, developers. We want to see you deploy capital with African-American developers. Tell us how you're going to do that, wow. which I've never heard. No one else that we've been talking to has ever said that to us. And uh, so, I mean, I think that part of this is going to have to come from the pension contributors, the, the people who are paying into the system. They need to say we want to see our money deployed fairly. Great point. I mean, when this money is given to the large investment banks and financial service advisors, there's no there's no expectation that they are going to provide capital on a basis that's reflective of our population demographics. There's no expectation that the developers that they back will provide or agree to goals of a certain threshold of minority and women business contractors. Hmm. They're, they're agnostic to any kind of equality yeah. or any kind of affirmative step on, on providing opportunities. And that's been the problem. So, I mean, I think that is this moment in time where what I'm, you know, I mean, what Black Lives Matter to me means is that Black Lives Matter, not just in terms of don't killing, don't kill us, right. um, but it means Black education matters. It means Black economic opportunity matters. It means, you know, Black dreams and Black ambitions matter. And so if all these businesses would just treat us in the same way they yeah. treat other people. Yeah. We would be way ahead. I mean, the biggest two of the biggest development projects going on in Manhattan right now. One is built by, being built by a guy who started off by selling wigs out of his living room. Um, and the <laughs> other one is being built by a guy who came over here, um, immigrated here, and drove taxi cabs. And mm -hmm. what those two people have in common, aside from being white men, is they had access to institutional capital. Gotcha. And institutional capital back then. Yeah. And what you see, and, and I asked some of the people in finance, why is this? Right. And what they explained to me is that when they look at the deal, when they underwrite a deal, they look at the deal, not the sponsor as much. That's why you can have people who give their properties back to the banks, default on their projects and so forth, still get to live to fight another day. Oh, that's a great Because point. it's about the deal. But when it comes to a black developer, it's never about the deal. It's about the developer. Everything we spend our time explaining when we are out in the capital markets mm -hmm. to finance our projects mm -hmm. is about our company and about me. Yeah. 
And I'll have people say I'm too political because I was on Obama's finance committee or <laughs> Congressional Black Caucus Foundation Board. But it's all about me. Yeah. Never as much about the project. That's what black developers have to face. Yeah. And so we have to say we're not going to accept that anymore. Right. Right. So let me ask you this. Um before we go to another deal, because you, you got a bunch of blockbusters, I want to get to one more. But but just staying here, one last moment. What, Don? What should be our ask? You know, in this moment, because I feel like, you know, this does feel different. I, yes. Right. It, it does feel like there is a level of energy and a level a level of um, <clears throat> engagement from folks. Uh, our our allies are seemingly as pissed off as we are. And I just want to make sure that we make the right ask. Um, I am as appalled by police brutality as anybody. Uh, it, it, it's disgusting and it has to stop. But I feel like we have an opportunity to make some bigger asks than, than don't kill me on the street. Right. Yeah. What, what, what should be our ask right now? Well, we think about where we are. Um, if we look at household net worth, um, average household net worth of a black household in this country is $17,000. The counter white counterpart is $171,000. Right. That disparity kind of tells it all. That's right. If you go to a place like Boston, the epicenter of liberalism, by the way, the average black household net worth is $8. $8. And the white household net worth is $247,500. Come on. That is the fact in Boston. So what you have is this, this, this the burdens of poverty are yeah. disproportionately carried by black people. So what we the ask is equal access to economic opportunity and that every aspect of American uh, finance, business and government take affirmative steps to rebalance these scales. Yeah. So do. And by the way, Think about it. I know no other place, no other communities in this country where they're looked at philanthropically. So what I mean by that is so affordable housing mm -hmm. in black communities. If it's a large scale affordable housing project, it's generally developed by a large white institutional developer. Mm -hmm. If it's a smaller one, it's a white developer who's early in their career right. going and doing a deal there. If it's developed by anybody of color, it's through a not-for-profit. Mm -hmm. So even when it's building housing for our own people in our own communities, mm -hmm. the system takes the profit out mm. so that we can't build wealth. And so, so do business with us like yeah. everybody else. And so make the ask should be the deployment of capital yeah. should be reflective of the population demographics of each place. So... New York City's 26% black. Okay. And 26% of the city's contract should go to black business. 26% of the, the city's pension system advisors, their private advisors, should be black businesses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, 26% of the loans that J.P. Morgan Chase makes in New York City should be to black people and black businesses. Right. So we want fair access to capital under the same underwriting rules. I mean, and also, I think we got to say we want a, uh, we want school choice for our children. I mean, we cannot stick our children in failing schools. And we, I mean, we just can't do it yeah. or we can't pray that we're going to make enough money to move to the suburbs where we can send our kids to a school away from their friends, but send them to a school where they can get a better life. Well, so we can't leave so many of our people behind. And uh, and I think those are I mean no I mean it's education yeah and economic opportunity yeah and um, I think that we get I mean that's a reasonable ask and uh, you know and I, I mean that's and so that's where I would think I mean you can't start a business without any money right as simple right. as that and 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 we can't have our people's success based on outlying events yeah. okay you're lucky or you're an outlier and you right. started a business with no money right and you're successful. Right. You know, these are, um, Don, these are kinds of uh, practical ideas and 
uh, things that somebody who's got a track record of success could probably implement if they were in elected office. I'm just just putting that out there. Just uh, <laughs> is that something that you've ever thought about? Yeah, I mean, I thought about running for mayor of D.C. Okay, and I, Marion tried to get me to run for mayor of D.C. And I thought about running for mayor um, of New York both times because of what I saw is economic disparities. In D.C., I saw D.C. taking steps backwards. Right. It's my city, my hometown. And I mean, taking steps backwards when it came to economic empowerment of black people. Yeah. And it angered me. And, uh, and then, you know, my mother, you know, um, my mother-in-law got sick, got um, cancer and died. And so I didn't run for office. Then I thought about running for mayor of New York because we elected a progressive guy who was supposed to come in and uh, rebalance these scales. And today, they do less than 2% of their contracts with minority businesses. And so, because I'm a believer, again, that our challenge, I mean, the way we get to an equal access of opportunity and equal treatment under the law is closing that wealth disparity. And the way we close that wealth disparity is access to a good quality education, um, um, and equal protection under the law, Mm -hmm. and access to capital, fair access to capital. And I mean, and, 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 B of A, Bank of America can say, hey, we're going to invest, on, we're going to allocate $100 million to black people. No, I mean, you guys lend out billions and billions of dollars, make loans to black businesses. Yeah, absolutely. And that's in entrepreneurs. And, 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 and so that's, I mean, that's, that's where we change things. Mm-hmm. And that was when Dr. King was assassinated, when he moved that's from right. civil rights to economic rights, the Poor People's Campaign. Mm-hmm. I mean, what did he say? Um, what good does it do um, the Negro if we can sit at a lunch counter, but we don't have the money to buy hamburgers? Exactly. I mean, right. You know, so I think that that's where we got to get to. Yeah. And, uh, and we got And that's our ask. All right. I couldn't agree more. Um, Don, to, to wrap up, do you have time to give us one more of your blockbuster deals? Maybe couple it with one of the principles that goes along with it? Sure. I mean, I think the best one for me would be the Royal Palm. Okay. Um, and the Royal Palm Hotel um, was, you know, a deal that, um, you know, I, I mean, in Miami, I was living in D.C. So fast forward in D.C., my son was born in 1994. 1995, Barry gets re 94, Barry gets reelected mayor of Washington. And uh, he takes off in 1995. I had the city was uh, attracting the Washington Wizards to move from Landover, Maryland, mm. back into downtown D.C. And so the former mayor um, had negotiated to move them back into D.C. And they were going to need to tear down some government office buildings to build that arena. And they had to relocate the government workers elsewhere. But well, that was at the really the epicenter um, of the financial crisis, the banking and saving the loan crises um, of the early 90s. And so I, my partners and I bought a couple of buildings and we competed. We bought them so cheap we could undercut everybody price mm-hmm. wise. And so we won the rights there and uh, we were um, $58 million less expensive than the next bid. Um, so clearly the city made a good deal to do that. So Barry comes into office gets reelected after being, you know, out of office for four years because right. of this, you know, um, issue of his drug arrest and then being in jail for six months. Sure. And uh, so he, he wins. The, the, the media, especially the Washington Post, is outraged. Congress is outraged. And so Washington Post starts picking on my leases and does two editorials, a series of front page articles. And ultimately, um, you know, and, and the law was changed. Um, before Barry came into office to take away that broad power that he previously had okay. and required all contracts over a million dollars to get approved by, um, you know, the city council. So my lease lingered in the city council and, uh, and then ultimately Barry withdrew it. He lost his nerve. And I was so shocked. I said, I mean, my God, I got a young son, you know, so my wife and I are sitting around and saying, I mean, I didn't intend to be $58 million less expensive. I mean, a million would have been more than enough. Yeah. I mean, and I said, if I can't win in my own hometown and be $58 million less expensive, I mean, my future is really not going to look good for a while. Right. How could this happen? So we went on a vacation in Miami um, and went to South Beach. I liked it. 
We got a vacation apartment and then came down for New Year's Eve, um, 1995. And I was reading an article in the paper of how they were looking for a developer of the Royal Palm Hotel site. And they were looking for a black developer because it was part of the settlement of a tourism boycott led by the NAACP um, to have more blacks in hospitality. And so this deal was, you know, for that, I looked at it and said, I'm going to go and bid on that. Tell my wife, we're going to bid on this. We're going to win. And it's going to change our lives. And then I put everything I had into winning that RFP, including uh, running, uh, like basically running a campaign, getting people to know me. And in the end, the, the deck was stacked. The mayor had planned on awarding it to a team led by Hyatt Hotels. Mm. I proposed a team that was 100% black owned. And, uh, and, and in the end of the day, I learned some lessons from DC. Yeah. And, um, and that was about the media, how to use the media. So I went to the Miami Herald and said, you all talked about all these things that the city needed to do and the community needed to do during the tourism boycott and how black people deserve a better chance. Well, here's your chance. I got a better deal. It's hundred percent black owned and they're trying to take it from me unfairly because of politics, because they want to make it a, 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 a give it to the higher family, to the Pritzker family. And, uh, and they wrote an editorial supporting me. And, uh, and that scared the mayor. Uh, this not didn't scare the mayor, but it scared some of the city council members. And I won that by a single point wow. on the vote. And uh, that was, uh, and I went on to build that hotel, it became the first major hotel in the United States, developed and owned by an African-American team. And, uh, and the lesson I learned there was a couple of them. One was each setback is an opportunity in disguise. The setback was I had a fifth, I had a, Great deal in D.C. that I was giving away to the city, and I was $58 million less expensive. My mentor was a mayor of the city as a black city. I'm a black developer of my hometown, and I couldn't win that. So that was a tremendous setback. But then with that setback made me look at Miami, which I wouldn't have looked at before. I was so happy in D.C. And then, um, you know, we won that deal in Miami. And then I realized that my skill set was portable. And then that took me to a place where my mindset changed. Mm -hmm. And then I built what is now a national development company. And I saw no borders anymore. And so that lesson was a very powerful lesson um, for me. And uh, and then also never say never. Never die. Never. Wow. Um, There is so much, uh, so many nuggets in that. uh, You know, I'll say again, if you guys have not picked up the book, you should pick up The People's Principles. Um, He chronicles, is it 10 or is it a dozen deals? 12 deals. 12 deals. And each one has one or more principles attached and um, just a lot of sort of palace intrigue in there about how he got the deal done. And I mean, it's it's a really phenomenal read, but it it really has these practical, tactical nuggets um, on how to, to get these deals across the finish line. So um, I really appreciate you coming on the show to share not only some of those stories about your real estate deals, but also just your thoughts on how we can fix this mess that we currently find ourselves in. Um, really appreciate it. So uh, thank you again for coming on. Uh, I am excited to hear how this project, this endeavor that you're working on and, and looking to get LPs on board to support Black developers to see how that pans and um, if there's any news to break, uh, maybe you'll come back and share that with us at some point in the future. That would be amazing. After, I'd love to do it. And um, I appreciate being up here. And I'm going to, if I don't get this one done, I'll die trying. But hey. I mean, I think that that's the role I'm here for is to help our people move forward economically in my industry. And my view is that if it's not me, then who's going to do it? And so I'm going to keep pushing until it gets done. There's no better place to end than that. Don, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for taking the time to visit with us and our audience. Uh, Enjoy the rest of your vacation. You you actually took some time out of your your vacation to spend with us. So uh, be safe. Have a wonderful time there. And we'll be in touch real soon. Thank you.